don't you know you're talking about a revolution it sounds don't you know you're talking about a revolution it sounds while they're standing in the welfare lines crying at the doorsteps of those armies of salvation wasting time in the unemployment lines sitting around waiting for a promotion don't you know they're talking about the revolution it sounds who are people gonna rise up and get their share Poor people gonna rise up and take what's theirs. Don't you know you better run, 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 run. Oh, I said you better run, 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 run. It's finally the tables are starting to turn. Talking about a revolution. Yes, finally the tables are starting to turn. Talking about a revolution. Oh, oh, oh no. Talking about a revolution. Oh, 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 while they're standing in the welfare lines. Crying at the doorsteps of those armies of salvation. Wasting time in the unemployment lines. Sitting around. Waiting for a promotion, don't you know? They're talking about a revolution, it sounds. How is it, everybody? Happy February 9th, 2024. It is Friday night. TGIF, everyone. Happy uh, happy Friday to you. Uh, it's delicious Providence water. So we are here tonight to do a special, special stream. Um, it's going to be live premiered. It is not going to be live, but we will premiere it live. Uh, due to some scheduling stuff, I couldn't connect with my good friend Kevin too too late so we're gonna do a little pre-record premiere it live on youtube i'll be in the chat if you guys want to talk we're gonna focus uh solely on uh me and kevin's film that we're moving full speed ahead on right now um sort of an a couple elements involved first of all a lot of my work on you know all these missing children from the 1970s and you know sort of my obsession with getting to the bottom of what exactly happened as you guys know you know um uh i was the victim of sorry it's wicked dark i apologize guys new house new me um the problem i'm having is just i haven't set up all my lights yet and all of my you know cool little gadgets that go on top of the computer to really brighten things up are not uh are just not readily available to me so um you know, obviously, I, I wrote a book, Monster, Life and Crimes of Wayne Chapman. I have a new book coming. Uh, I've got an obsession, which is more of a sequel to that, a continuation of the story, if you will. And, um, you know, I, I was obviously the victim of childhood sexual abuse. And I am, uh, you know, uh, just, you know, when I did the book, I wanted to do a period piece. I wanted to show you guys, the reader, what life was like to be a child in the 1970s in this area, right? And I think I really missed the mark on that. And I, I think I did a lot better job this time around. That said, I think I did a good enough job explaining a very fucking convoluted story with 1800 tentacles growing out of it that you have to sort of sew up, you know? And um, with Kevin, he he is somebody who, of all the people that I know in my life, he is the one person above all 
that I can really bounce this off of. And he he's the uh, the best friend in the truest sense of, you know, he doesn't lie to me. If it's not good or if I'm wrong, he tells me. And that is just so fucking invaluable to have as a writer and a researcher, investigator, if you will. Uh, I think that term's thrown around a little too loosely a lot. So um, that's why, you know, when we came up with the idea for the documentary and, you know, Kevin talked me through it and I was like, this is just, it's one thing to write a book. It's another thing to make it come to life. You know what I mean? And uh, we're going to hope to do that for you in the, the coming months and in, in years, maybe even, hopefully, Lord willing. And um, so I want to get with Kevin tonight and talk to my good friend about everything that we've sort of come together on in the last, say, eight or nine months. So let's bring Kevin in for one more time for old time's sake. Jesus, Kevin, this doesn't seem too weird at all, does it? It seems just normal. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is So this is what it's like inside the Dave McGrath <laughs> show. <laughs> yeah, well, best best of luck to you here. Um, do you remember our very first telephone conversation? Yeah, absolutely. And I remember your first message to me, actually, too. Um, you, It was a comment, actually, on mm -hmm. a YouTube video that I did on the Andy Puglisi story. And you said, I literally wrote the book on this. <laughs> <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, I, I just remember that. And I didn't know who you were. And then I got the book and I read the book and I was like, wow, this book is really, really good. It's really um, explored some interesting stuff that seems to be relatively unexplored by a few people. Melanie Perkins has obviously had similar theories and stuff like that. But also the book was really personal. It was a personal story because of your own experiences. And your second book was to be is to be called Obsession. But that obsession came through in the first book, which is part of what made it so good. It's funny. Somebody asked me the other day, um, somebody that we know asked me, how did you meet Kevin? And in my mind, you reached out to me because you read the book and then i went back and thought about it as we were preparing to do this show and that's true i had actually one day i think it was in march i had typed in andy puglisi's name into youtube and your video and i thought you were the guy narrating it i know now yeah. that you got you got a professional narrator and all that i so i thought you were the guy narrating it and yeah. And I commented, I said, yes, I literally wrote the book and, and I didn't want to be boastful. What I wanted to do was because anytime you like you feel like you're a subject matter expert on a specific subject, anytime someone else talks about it, you know, you it's hard not to be like, hey, you should talk to me. I know. You know what I mean? And for you, it, it's kind of a personal story, too, because you were the same age as Andy. Again, for the backstory, guys, if you haven't read anything that I've done. Andy Puglisi disappears 21 August 1976. Higgins Memorial Pool, Lawrence, Massachusetts. About, what do you say, 30 minutes north of Boston, say, give or take? Yep, yep, yep. On a good day? A less than that, yep. yep. Um, Back then it was. <laughs> Nowadays, it's like 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you to the big, thank you to the big dig. Go us. But, um, yeah. yeah. Um, So this little boy disappears, you know, I don't know, 10 years before I'm born. You're at you're what age at that time, Kev? I was like nine and a half, so maybe a half, so basically ten, basically same age as him, a few months younger, and I lived about a mile away from where he went missing. So you literally lived it as it was happening in real time back in '76. Tell me, you you know we've talked about it ad nauseum, but for the listener, what was it like living that as a kid, Andy's age? Yeah. And it's, you know, fortunately, the thing about me is my memory is different. Like I can't remember names a lot of times from people I meet or phone numbers or uh, directions, but I remember events very, very well. Or if somebody tells me a story, I remember very well. But in this case, I remembered it. It was a, the whole city was really on edge because of it. And things were different back then. Now we live in a time when kids, um, you see them at the bus stop with their parents and the bus goes to their end of their street. When I was growing up, it wasn't like that. Kids roam free as long as you were home by the time the street lights were on. And parents weren't aware of the dangers that were out there. Nobody knew. And so when this kid went missing, the city was shocked. And uh, me being the same age, I didn't know Andy, but um, I was shocked. And then it was 
they were, everything's on Ed's. The National Guard was there, and you'd mm -hmm. see helicopters overhead, and you know, uh, uh, the Green Berets even came in. Yep. Um, so everybody was searching. There. Yeah, and then, yeah. Um, and and then, was it five or six days into it? All of a sudden, there was a newspaper headline, which I actually remember this. I mean, because I used to look at the papers back then, and it's basically said that we have reason to believe that Andy's with family, and every, and everything, everybody just stopped worrying right then and there. So it's a great point that you hit on right there. The fact that the police came out, the Lawrence Police Department came out and said, we have reason to believe that Andy Puglisi, who, by the way, guys, you know, spoiler alert, here we are in 2024, Andy's still missing. No body, uh, no, no answers for the family. I believe his mother is still alive. Um, okay, that said, it, it, the Lawrence Police come out about a week later, you know, late August, early September, of 76 and say we have reason to believe that he's with family and sort of the whole thing and if you again if you guys read my book you'll know that that statement right there really killed this investigation early on because it was clear that andy was not with family you're right there buddy yeah i just checked on the mic i forgot i had a different setting from when i interviewed bill and in, who was in prison mm -hmm. and i had to hold my phone up here Sorry, I didn't mean to distract you. I just I had no. my mic on the wrong setting. I hope it didn't sound funny. We no, it's can't, fine. We can't check with a live audience to see. So yeah, I know. Definitely everybody would be screaming at you right now. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Hopefully it sounded but, all right. <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, my light sucks too. So we're just, you know, whatever. I have a face for darkness, though. It's good. Um, so yeah, that that really hurt that investigation, them coming out and saying that. And, you know, obviously, as we now know. There were, there's been varying reports, none of which I've ever been able to solidify. And I know that Melanie has said often that there were, I think the number was five sex offenders at the pool that day. I'm not really sure how we arrived on that, if that came from police reports or anything like that. I've looked into these cases for years. I've never seen a single police report that said there was five sex offenders at the pool uh, that day. But we do know that one definitely lurked there. And that was uh, a New York man named Wayne Chapman who had been at the pool a year prior, raped two boys. He ended up pleading to it eventually and, and got essentially what was a life sentence, although he did end up getting out. So Andy goes missing. Here we are all these years later, and we, we still have absolutely no answers. And me and you were out with Melanie. Uh, when did we do that? Last August, right? Well, uh, it was August 1st. August 1st, 2023. So last summer, uh, me and Kevin went out. We went to Lawrence. We went to the pool. We went down the uh, sort of, uh, uh, help me out here, Kevin, where the gravel once was. Does that lead to, uh, there's now a football field, uh, like a kid's yeah, there's football a, field. There's the yeah, soccer, there's a soccer field there. It's behind the high school. The new high school is built in that area. Um, just to give you a Lawrence perspective on it, I knew the area like it's right near the football stadium, the main, the big football stadium that's been there for a hundred years, and that's where that what, what's that's what dominates that whole area. And I went to fireworks there all the time and football games. I never went behind that pool. Now that area is, but the area behind the pool is between the pool and the highway. And I just assumed it was much smaller than it is until I went out with Melanie and you and Aaron mm -hmm. and Tom Fleming and a bunch of other people that were with us for that crew that day. Um, and I had I was stunned at how vast that area is and how truly easy it would be for a body to go missing in there, even with hundreds of people looking. Yeah. And uh, as Kevin pointed out, it's true. A Army Special Forces unit from Devons up there north of Boston uh, was activated, a unit that had just come home from Vietnam that had seen some heavy fighting in the early 70s uh, that has now since been disbanded, was actually out. They had created a mission brief. Um, they had this whole five-point plot on a map of how they were going to find this little boy back there. They obviously didn't. Um, there was, you know, the, the dive team, I believe at one point there was a massive, there was a hundreds and hundreds of volunteers, uh, truckers with CB radios. I mean, this dominated the headlines for a little bit of time anyway, after it happened. So, uh, it's, yep, it's absolutely. interesting. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's interesting to think nowadays, uh, with Amber alerts and code Adam and all the things that happen when a kid goes missing, 
that uh, this little this little kid who you know was last seen with a a little boy, a uh, friend of his, and a man matching the description of Wayne Chapman um, was just literally never seen again. And there's varying reports of, it, of what exactly happened. Uh, we, we don't need to get into that um, a lot. All of it, all all of it is in the book. Um, mm-hmm. s- some of what I think nowadays is in the new book. You know, I, that's the thing about these cases that are so old, you know, um, sort of your thought process is kind of malleable in the sense of like, um, I believed one thing, you know, in 2018 when I wrote that chapter. And I'm not sure I believe that same thing in 2024. <laughs> you know, and, and you might be back to believing again next year. You don't you know, you don't really know. Um, I just wanted to add to just some part of my experience about this. So uh, in the coming years after that, there were things that went on and I became a newspaper boy. So I would see the stories case, you know, maybe three, four five years later, they'd go dig in at locations. They brought in psychics. So it would mm-hmm. at this point, it was clear he was gone and something bad had happened. Uh, it took years for us to know that. Um, now I went on to go to school in Worcester to college in Worcester. And then, uh, later on, I managed to bartend and managed to bar own a bar in Worcester. So I have been out of Lawrence for 20 years, I think so roughly when a series of articles came out in the Boston globe. Now, nobody had tipped me off ahead of time. I, every day I was a big newspaper guy. I'd get out. I, if there was no heralds, I bought the globe, you know? And I'm reading the Globe, and I see this story that was based on Melanie's work, and my memory of those articles. And that, and that I was, it was like a six day series, and I, is of going out every day after that to get the paper to read this. And later, so when I did the research for this case uh, a couple of years ago, before I knew you, and I was looking over Melanie's work, and I talked to Melanie a little bit, and I went back and I looked at the old Boston Globe series, which is online now, and my memory is that. As good as that is, that that what they have now online is much less than what was in the original newspaper, the printed version. I think they've cut a lot of it out. I'm not sure about that. I should have asked Melanie when we saw her, but I got the sense that they cut a lot of it out. Yeah, um, but the when digi- I was digital. Go ahead, yeah. go ahead, Kev. Go ahead. So just so and when I was reading this back um, in Worcester, and you're you're reading back to your childhood because it happened at that time, and I remembered it all very well. And uh, one of the amazing things about it, it reads like a true thriller kind of story story or mystery in the sense that there are she's each day would bring out a new suspect that looked really like, wow, that's got to be it. That's got to be it. And then the next day she would say, well, no, they probably not, you know, reveal why there's a better suspect. It's just amazing. Well, <clears throat> you know, it's too funny just to back up a little bit. I wrote in the beginning portion of my book that it all started with a cold for me and I was sick and I was up late and I had seen the documentary Have You Seen Andy and it wasn't even so much about Andy to me it was more about Chapman just seeing his face seeing his booking photo and going you know whatever that is that thing I'm looking at right now I I need to know why that thing was you know what I mean and when I first talked had you to you, before? Had, had absolutely, you heard of absolutely, before? Ab- I never heard of Puglisi before. I didn't even know the case. I knew nothing about yeah. it, and All I right. grew up only a half hour from Andy. Again, I yeah. I came ten years after he was gone, but yeah. I don't even right. ever remember seeing anything in the Globe or the Herald like you describe that came out. Yeah. I think that series you're talking about came out like in maybe two thousand, two thousand one. Um, I don't even I don't even remember seeing that. Uh, so I yeah. knew nothing about it. This is the first thing I had ever heard was that night, probably 2014. Have you seen Andy on HBO? Hour and a half, hour and 15 minute docu, docu, uh, documentary made by Melanie Perkins, who's become a friend over time of ours. And um, the, what, what really got me was that... Um, when we first talked, you said... Oh yeah, I'm I'm doing a screenplay about that. You know, I was sick with COVID and um, you know, I decided to do a screen and me and you both basically came to the same conclusion about what happened to Andy. It was pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah, and- a lot of the ideas that I put into the screenplay were similar. I which were not necessarily what I think happens. I don't I have a lot I don't know. It's like you said it changes all the time. Um, yeah. but yeah, we had some similar ideas that I put 
maybe they were all inspired by Melanie. I don't, re I don't recall. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, maybe they, maybe she though reading this Melanie stuff planted some seeds with you and you just, you yeah. know, sort of carried that subconsciously. Mm -hmm. But I, as a rule, when I did the book, I never once spoke to Melanie. We never once talked during the research for the book. I read very little. Um, every once in a while, I would go to her website and, and, you know, maybe get the timeline right. You know what I mean? I would, oh, you know, when did I, you know, when did this happen? Or when did that, I want, when you do a book, you want to make sure like, I don't make like silly mistakes, like getting a fucking date wrong or something like that, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, but I just found it to be an interesting synergy between me and you that when you read my book, you said, yeah, you know, I basically came to the same conclusion with Chapman and we had never known each other. We had never, right. I'd never heard of you. We had never had spoken even once to each other. I had no idea you existed. So I thought that was interesting. And I think it's interesting as we move forward too, because the reason why you're the perfect person to talk these, these particular cases with is that you're kind of like me in the sense of you have a very curious mind. And even though you're not technically a guy who's even interested in true crime, I think sometimes like I have, I think I feel like I pull you in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. The book did and talking to you did. And um, that was the my idea for the documentary, which I think we might we're, we'll talk about this tonight, maybe expanded beyond what the original idea was. But the original idea was that half of it was about your theory and Melanie's theory that there were accomplices in this, which struck me as being something as that's pretty rare. I wasn't dismissing it, just that, that it was rare. Mm -hmm. And there seemed to be some evidence to at least suggest that maybe that happened here. So sure. I was interested in proving that theory or seeing if we could move anything in the direction of that theory. But then also just the personal aspect of it, because you being a victim mm -hmm. um, that drove you, and and we were very interested. We were down there at shooting that day. Melanie mentioned she was down there with... Um, I think the doctor she works with, the forensic doctor. Yeah, I can't, I can't remember, remember her name. name. Yep, me neither. <laughs> and, and they were down there one day just walking through and discussing things. And they saw someone off in the distance mm -hmm. kind of also there looking at stuff. And she goes, was that you? Yes. And you're like, yeah, it was me. And I saw you it and was. I recognized you, but I didn't want to go up and bother you and stuff like that. I so. remember that day perfectly because on her Facebook page, she had put out that they were going to do a – sort of a soft search or dig. I can't remember exactly which one, some combination mm -hmm. of the two. And I said, well, I, I got to at least see this, you know, but yeah. I did not listen. Melanie had a fucking Emmy award, you know, she's not like, you know, the easiest person to approach, I guess, you know, and it's a very tough moment for her. She's down there digging and searching for a friend of hers, a story that's obviously mm -hmm. incredibly personal to her. So I didn't feel like it was, um, appropriate you know to come up to her and be like hey you know i'm dave i'm i'm writing this book i'm fucking nobody yeah. I'm, I'm doing it in my mom's basement you know what i mean you know what i mean so yeah. um, and she's and she's with the, the doctor she's with is also a woman so two women you're the guy there's no one else yeah. around you feel like yeah. you could be intimidating and yeah yeah N none none of it made none of it worked so i didn't do it yeah. thankfully but she remembered she was like i recognize yeah. you because of that day and yeah. it was a crazy moment. I never brought it up to her. She knew. And it's it, there's all these yeah. crazy moments. You know what I mean? But I really believe in, in science over superstition. Um, you know, I really do. And, you know, I'm still in my heart 99.9% .9 sure that Wayne Chapman killed Andy Puglisi, probably with somebody else. And mm -hmm. the, other reasons, you know, Barjona made statements at the end of his life you know, about how him and Chapman had pulled off the side of the road. I mean, they both had the same alibi. I found that to be incredibly damning for them. Eyewitnesses knew he was there, um, pointed him out. You know, he had polio. He walked with a limp. He had a scar over his face. He was six foot three. He was pretty imposing. Um, he had came back to the scene the next day, according to two lifeguards, uh, one of which talked to me uh, a few years back. And she said, yep, the guy walked right up to me and said, what's all the hubbub about? Is it about that missing kid? And they said, of course, it's about that missing kid. You know, um, there's a lot of reasons to believe that Wayne Chapman was a perpetrator. And, you know, me and you have talked many, many times over the last seven months. And we go through varying levels of, of like hope 
and then just total hopelessness that anything's ever going to happen on this case, you know? Yeah. You know, it's like, and you try to find those little reasons for believing that in general, that there are more cases than we are, than we think, than we suspect that involve accomplices. And one of the possible reasons for that is that what we see, and man, you're like an encyclopedia of true crime. I can't, any case I look, I'm like, I, I'm a total rookie and anything I bring up, you've already know the case, the guy, like I brought up Lawrence Singleton the other day. Oh yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, but we see a lot of these guys, even when they're really intelligent, like say a Ted Bundy, when it comes time to commit their crimes, they're so in the heat of their mm -hmm. impulses that are overpowering them that they make stupid mistakes, right? And that's a lot of times how they end up being caught. But if you're working as an accomplice, if you're working with an accomplice, that you're you're that's gonna minimize a little bit some of the mistakes because someone's gonna sure. say, Hey, you know, so there's a lot of unsolved cases out there. And so maybe a higher percentage of those involve accomplices than our normal, right? Does that make sense? Just kind of because they were more likely to get away with it, right? So you've ran that by me many times. Um, I guess we should say that, you know, Chapman also allegedly, I've alleged it in my book. I believe it. I, I, I think I can prove it here in the next book. Chapman was close to two other pedophiles who we, he worked with, he stalked kids with, he he molested boys with, and ultimately, in my opinion, murdered boys with. Charles Pierce, serial pedophile, child murderer out of Haverhill, Massachusetts, by way of Florida. Nathaniel Barjona, Worcester, Massachusetts guy, 1957 born, by way of Great Falls, Montana. Ended up killing a boy uh, in Montana, being released. There's a be a... If, we could talk the whole show about Barjona. I'm just trying to set a little bit of framework for you guys. And I believe that one or two of those guys were his accomplices that day. Uh, more likely Pierce than Barjona, because anybody who's listening to this, go Google a picture of Nathaniel Barjona. He's a hard fucking guy not to find in a lineup. He's about 350 pounds. Monster. Just a monster. Big beard. Different color eyes. Um, very, very... I mean, if you saw this guy, you'd remember this guy. And so I don't believe he was there that day. I think Pierce could have even, or maybe there's someone else, right? There's other people that we just four year old boy. Well, unless Bar, unless Bar Jonah was in a car, like, or something, right? And wasn't, right. you know, was right. waiting on the other side of the woods because the year, the summer before, Chapman had raped those two boys and he walked them out of the woods on the other side, right? And he came out at a parking lot for what used to be a, a bar. Um, is that so, where the park is? Is that the name that park? I can't remember the name of it now. Um, we went by it. Right? Uh, no, that's across. Yeah, we did, but that's across the street actually, and that was a mistake that was in the Boston Globe article that said it was. Um, I, I should know the name, and it begins with an H. I can't quite think of it at the moment, but yeah, it's a this kind of a park preserve there, and uh, I, but I don't think that that's. I don't know. And then Melanie has also recently told us more specifically because she's mm -hmm. been working with the rape victims. But in any yep. case, they. He did walk them through what at the time there would have been paths along the river that came out in the back there to what is Route 114. And yeah. so somebody could have been waiting in a parking lot there and it could have been sure. They, and so that nobody would have seen him. So barge owner or whoever, you know, I, I, I think there's there's more to chew on with that than than there isn't. But, you know, nobody saw him. So I have no proof that he was there. But right. Right. A four-year-old boy who was there with Andy that day in the ensuing years since this. Now, again, I used to 100% believe this story. I used to believe this little boy who said he saw Andy getting crushed underneath a rock by two men. He remembered that. He gave that interview to Melanie. He told the police that years later. It wasn't until I had my own four-year-old that I started to think that this may not be true because yeah. I, I look at Gunner, I look at Connor and I go, I know kids don't lie. Like kids don't lie. They don't, they, they tell it like yeah. it is. It, it's not, it's yeah. lying is like learned behavior, right? It's a behavior that you learn. And that being said though, like, I think if Connor told me that story, I'd be like, mm -mm. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, once you get around a four-year-old. If he told it the next know? day, maybe. But if he told you when he was 10, like it happened Thank here, you. that the kid's right. name was Ray. Ray Clark, And yep. he was, you know, 
very, very, um, you know, he's a projects kid, so troubled background, troubled school system. And suddenly he comes forward when he's 10 and tells somebody in school, this, you know, one of the one of the staff about his memory of this. Um, yes. I, you know, without you, I'm walking delicately here, but there's a lot of reasons to wonder about why he would come forward then. And I'm, this it's not an accusation at all. And it's it's just you're talking about a kid, you yes. know, and and the, and then the guy, they, the police bring in or send in or whatever t- to communicate with this guy was the one who earlier had brought in the psychic and this where he that's where he found the psychic was at a convention down in texas that he yeah. went down on regressive <laughs> hypnosis yeah so yep. did this cop use or attempt in his amateur way to use regressive hypnosis on the boy and there's just right. so many things that could lead to there could be some kernel of truth there too but as far right. as the specifics wow just, it's uh, so hard. It's tough. It's tough. And, you know, I'm not saying I don't believe Ray. And if he ever sees yeah. this, you know, I can only imagine the trauma that he went through had he been there. Mm-hmm. And he was there. Yeah. We know he was because he was. And, you know, there's, you know, Wayne Chapman was interviewed later by police, you know, specifically Al Mintz, who me and you have interviewed on, on your channel on Yellow Cottage Tales. And, you know, they talked about the CB radios. Um, that Andy had, and then his friends corroborated that Andy had just gotten some new CB radios and he was super jazzed up about it. He talked. So Chapman knew that little detail that, yeah. you know, these cases are one and solved in those little details, right? How would you know that? You just couldn't unless you were with them. Mm-hmm. And Ray, the same thing. So um, anyway, you mentioned that cop and uh, what happened was a Lawrence police uh, patrolman, an actual a young guy on the force, he wasn't a detective or anything, he had just really gotten on, um, had went down to Texas to see a psychic, and he was so blown away by this fucking psychic, he actually started like a, a local charity fund where he would put jars in different stores around mm-hmm. Lawrence, and I, I, wrote, I, I wrote about this a ton in the book. And, mm-hmm. and I wish I could remember this cop's name now. I've written it 500 fucking times and I can't remember it. Now. <laughs> but um, forgive me guys. The, and he actually paid to fly this psychic up here. And this was in the 1980s, early 1980s. And the psychic yeah. gave a lot of different, you know, he went out to that football field and marked where a couple places where Andy could have been buried. And, um, he took a bunch of Andy's belongings because he wanted to have his notebook where he wrote some, he made drew some pictures and stuff. And they were really confident that this guy was going to help him solve the case. And then he just disappeared. He went back to Texas. Nobody could ever get a hold of him again. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, eventually they found him dead of a suicide. So he committed suicide. And whatever happened of that, you know, anything that he could have helped them with obviously died with him. So it's just not one of those weird uh, sidebars. You know, I think I wrote this line mm-hmm. a million times. Like it's a weird, it's another weird story in a fucking story full of weird stories, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And we've talked, another thing we've talked about a lot is what the people, and I'm, my experience of this is really, I, I, it's been eye opening over the last year. Um, but the different things that people look for in looking at true crime or get out of these cases. So I tend to focus, I don't like the thinking about the suffering or any of that stuff. So mm-hmm. if the only way I can do it is if I stand back and look at a puzzle and try to solve the puzzle. But other people that are more compassionate and empathetic to me, empathetic to me, it's different. So I look at like, for instance, this case in the case that you like you mentioned the, the little book that the psychic took of Andy's. It mm-hmm. was actually a book of poems. That's and it's right. just it it's poems. crushing. It's, yep. it's yeah, and it's crushing to think that a 10-year-old kid living in the projects in a broken home kind of a uh, very you know troubled home in a lot of ways is writing who's writing poetry at 10 who's writing it's just poetry amazing. yeah you know you're I mean, right you're right it's just uh right. and, and then we should and then also mention to too go ahead yeah no i just say for the mother to lose that you know how tragic because the, the psychic disappeared with it but yeah and they still to this day talk about how bad they want it back and the guy's been dead for i don't know 30 yeah. years who knows you know so um yeah I guess we should mention too, when we're talking about a lot with other cases about the police fucking up and corruption and there's a lot of the police fucking up in this case. And there's some corruption too. And we had Al Mintz, the Providence police detective on your channel, 
just last summer. Mm -hmm. And he literally told us in Providence in the 1970s, he would try and shut down child pornography shops in Providence. He said there was one directly across the street from the Providence police station. You remember this story well. You know where I'm going. Mm -hmm. And he said he walked in there one day and he said, get this fucking shit off the racks. And the guy said, yes, sir. No problem. And he said within a couple minutes, his lieutenant was calling him up to the office and say, stop giving that guy problems. You know, it's like it's it'll blow you away. You know, and me and you were yep. like, we we could we didn't even fashion a response. We were just our jaws were on the fucking floor. You know, we we couldn't yep. believe that story. And you want to talk about and he had the fucking... balls. Go ahead. He had the balls to when the lieutenant threatened him, and he was a young guy. You know the way he told the story. Well, fuck you. I'm gonna. He had the book of uh, in his hand with child pornography. Yeah. You know this is this is prior to the video age, really. You know, and he goes up to the chief's office, slaps yes. it down on the desk. Yep. You lieutenant is protecting this guy. <laughs> yeah. And just so you guys know, that lieutenant went on to make major and he ended up getting arrested for being a corrupt piece of shit later on in the 80s. But that's a whole nother story. Guys, read the next book if you want to know that story. Anyway, because I, t- I do a lot of Providence police corruption in the new book because it's just so fucking crazy. And yeah. the reason why we even bring that story up is because it has long been my theory that Wayne Chapman serial child molester child killer was the reason why he even was in our area in new england was because this was the mecca for the production distribution of child pornography and there's no it's in every document that you can read on the fbi files i recommend everybody go to governmentattic.org and just read the nambla files it's voluminous it's about a thousand pdfs that you can read they Tell openly talk. Yeah, Nambla's North American Man Boy Love Association. It's a uh, it's a uh, political activist organization that started as a direct result to what happened in Revere, Massachusetts, in the nineteen seventy seven, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but what the reason why I brought that up is because they they talk in these all these are open source now. There's communication between the Boston and New York FBI office where the New York FBI office is 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 warning the Boston resident agency. Hey, Roy DeMeo, who's a New York tri- crime guy, crime boss, mafia dude, sold his child pornography business to you guys. Raymond Patriarca, who runs Providence right here where I'm sitting, is now running the show for the production of child porn pay fucking attention to this you can see it it's just incredible how you see it go up and up and up you know and i'm talking from 68 right into like 74 75 prime time for wayne chapman to arrive on the scene who's coming from new york um and that that's you know i don't think and i know me and you have argued back and forth lord knows i don't want to argue with you tonight kevin i would just like to have some friendly banter if possible because, you know, I, I opined in the book, like, this guy did not fucking wake up one morning and throw a fucking dart at a map. I mean, he just didn't. Nobody ends up in Providence, Rhode Island. This is the armpit of America. Unless there's something, there's work here. And I think that's what it was. I think Wayne Chapman knew I, I can't peddle my shit and I can't produ- produce my shit here for the big money. But I can definitely do it there for the big money. And that's how he ended up here. That's what I think. Mm. And just to jump on something that you said in your intro, how, you know, Kevin will show me where I'm wrong or something like that. But that isn't, I think, a, maybe I pref- way I would prefer to you say it is I just ask questions. I, if it's just, it's not that I know the answer. It's more like we'll keep asking questions. I do it to myself for my own theories. And uh, even just, you know, today talking to someone, you know, well connected to another case that we all know the uh karen carpenter case um but i'm just teasing dave uh (laughs) but but but, um wow but i but i do this i do the same thing with them it's like i ask the same hard questions and so that's all it is it's just asking questions and asking questions and asking questions until you get answers unfortunately in these old cases you may never get the answers but in your book, Monster, The Life and Crimes of Wayne Chapman, it's I don't think there's any other book out there like that because there's so many other angles to this that you brought into it from the what looks like a 
a child porn production in Revere, potentially. Mm-hmm. Although there's, mm-hmm. there's disputes now, was it just you know Tons. an area yeah. where people would, yeah? And then the 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 doctor in Connecticut that worked in mm-hmm. Hartford that yep. um, may even have had some connection to Wayne Chapman, but it's elusive yep. and it's elusive to yep. the Catholic Church, but it's yep. you know a, a priest. It was a Catholic hospital, and um, you know, what, there's so can, much. Can there, I stop you right there, Kevin? Can I stop yeah, you right there? Yeah. I just feel like this needs a little bit of context. So I wrote a chapter in the book called The Doctor, and it was about a doctor. In 2005, a young couple were re... They had just bought in a big house in North in uh, West Hartford, Connecticut. They were remodeling the downstairs. It had a finished basement. They opened up a wall, and um, I believe it ended up being 50,000 pictures and 4,000 reels of crude homemade child pornography. And it was taken by a doctor in um, West Hartford, Connecticut, who had been connected to the Catholic Church. He was known to be best friends with a father in Connecticut named Francis Otero, who had been basically tossed out of an archdiocese in New York because he was peddling and producing child pornography. And Otero is had a light shown on him because Otero was an informant for the New York Police Department. And he basically... What he did was, and again, in all of the research I've done on Otero, I have never seen one thing he ever turned over to the FBI. So whatever he did as an informant, he produced nothing. And that made me wonder, like, did they put this guy on the books for a reason? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because we know that the Catholic Church, I mean, look what they did with Spotlight. In our our neck of the woods, Kevin, I mean, what did they do? They were destroying these young kids for decades, and they would just reassign them, and, you know, nothing ever came of it. And that's what I think with – and Otero was connected to this doctor because they worked at the same hospital. And, um, you know, many, many witnesses have told me over the years, including the lead detective on the case out there in Hartford, told me these two fucking guys were joined at the hip and fuck if I ever know what those two did together. So that's why I brought up this, you know, doctor because he was from upstate New York and he had two homes 30 minutes from where Wayne Chapman grew up. And I found that to be interesting. Am I reaching? Maybe, probably. Let's be honest. I'm probably reaching, but I just thought it was interesting and, and this guy was the most prolific creator, producer of child pornography that the state of Connecticut had ever known. And guess how many days he did in jail? Exactly zero. So, um, no, it's, it's, it's unproven, but it's not a reach. It's absolutely interesting. And this is why when we did the shoot in Lawrence this summer, we also, you know, so a lot of your work intersects, you bring it, I think a lot further, but intersects, intersects with Bellany's continuing work. And, um, we did a, an interview of you guys in front of a store there that was a store 24 back at the time. Mm-hmm. And Melanie or yeah. you, I think Melanie had found out that was the manager or the clerk there was later caught. He was selling child porn mags from behind the counter there. Yeah. And he was a guy that was commuting to work every day from Providence, right? From Providence. Yep. He was a that's Providence a guy. <laughs> yeah. It's like I an mean, hour and a half. That's a shitty, shitty ride, no matter what time of day. And I know it because I've done it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. there, what, what Kevin's talking about is right down the street from the pool, there's a store, which has now of course been rebranded. It's just a corner store, but at the time of Andy's disappearance, it was well known that you could buy child pornography there. And the gentleman who ran the store was from Providence, everything related to this has its tentacles back to right here. And I sort of did my best without reaching. And I know looking back on it, I know that Kevin, you know, I have a bias towards my own thoughts and I look for like the human brain acts like you, you say all the time. You're when you have those blinders on, you're only going to reach for the things that work for you. Am, am I right about mm-hmm. that? You know? Yeah, yeah. These cases when they become personal, and it's a, it's when it your your book is so interesting because it's personal, that can occasionally lead to biases. But when we have these conversations, you're never at all hesitant to confront those biases or have have them questioned and stuff. You have this. You ask the same questions generally yourself. So I mean, you know, it's uh, and, and 
how it should be a group effort on something like that. If if there's a team work, I, I would imagine if an effective police team, it's the same thing. They're each questioning <coughs> each other's theories, and that's sure. that's the only way you eventually get to some kind of answers. I treat these cases almost like science. Like everything needs to be heavily scrutinized by your peers. And then when we all agree on something, then we can push it out there. You know what I mean? And um, I didn't do that enough with Monster. You know, it was sort of a solo mission. You know what I mean? And, you know, of course I had an editor, but uh, I feel like Molly was just like, Dave, this is, this is crazy. Just let's get it out there, you know? So, and people were scared. I mean, listen, they were scared. They're like, this book isn't going to sell. Nobody's going to like it. And, you know, again, I think it was like number eight yesterday. It's been out for two years. So, um, <clears throat> you know, whatever, who cares? But so anyway, so we have the Providence connection there at store 24. You know, once I sort of figured Puglisi to the best of my knowledge, I started reaching out more. Right. And then I started looking at other missing children cases, you know, like um, Lee Savoy, like uh, in Revere, 1974, Kurt Newton. Maine, Douglas Chapman, no relation to Wayne, Maine. So we know Chapman had been in Maine a ton. He had described areas just like where uh, Kurt Newton disappeared from, like literally to a T. I know I've been there. And I went there just to so I could see visually what Chapman was talking about. And it was so dead on from where this kid disappeared from. It, 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 made, it dropped me to my knees, Kevin. You know, so I think that so now I've got two potential Chapman victims right there. One I know for sure, Puglisi. The other one, not so sure about. But I have my my feeling on it. Um, then we have Lee Savoy, 1974, Revere, Massachusetts. A lot has been talked about on Savoy. Um, it's one of those cases, this one kills me more than any of them because I just feel like there's not any information out there about the 1974 disappearance of 10-year-old Lee Savoy. Until, I think what I've done on him is the most that anybody's ever done. And I don't feel like I've done a lot. And it's always just and my only information on that primarily comes through your book. And when I look at what you uncovered, you talked to the restaurant owner mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. near the, uh, near the racetrack where these kids, he was on his way to um, Suffolk Downs racetrack where the kids back then, it was a common thing for kids to earn money by being a shoe shine boy. And so he was on his way there to make some money. But he stopped at a restaurant where he knew the owner of some little restaurant and he left his shoe shine equipment there, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, why would you leave your equipment if you're going to shine shoes? You wouldn't. So it suggests, and you talk to the actual, you talk to the mm -hmm. restaurant owner who's still alive. So, um, yeah, I don't know if he's alive now, but in 2016, he was alive. And I basically asked him, Did you remember anything about the Savoy disappearance? Uh, this is a 10 year old boy who left his house that day because he wanted to make some extra money so he could buy his mother something for Easter. He disappeared in early April. I believe it was April 7th, 1974. Um, uh, 0.8 miles away from 242 Mountain Ave, where the uh, sex ring was later uncovered. We'll get there. Um, and there's just so little detail about this young boy's disappearance. Um, that it really struck me and it's so hard to even research it because it just sort of disappeared except for one note about two weeks prior in March of 1974, a little boy was approached over by Suffolk Downs and he was asked him and his friend were asked to come wash an older man's car. And basically they said, Hey, listen, we'll throw you 10 bucks. You guys can split it. One boy went, one boy stayed, and this man uh, beat this kid nearly to death and left him in a field in Revere. The man's name was Richard Magnasco, and Richard Magnasco was later a NAMBLA member, and he was one of the founding members of the NAMBLA group, and he beat this little boy who we've talked to. Um, I recently talked to I him. Have I have not. No, we, 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 that's yeah, right. That's we right. interview yeah. him for the documentary. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to tie it to that. So this gentleman who was, you know, then a boy, now a much older man um, is willing to do an on camera with us and talk about Richard Magnasco's brutal beating. The kid was in intensive care for a month. He almost died. And Magnasco did end up going to jail, but he, 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 li he lived on after that. And, and, and did he offend or didn't he, you know, I, I have no idea I sort of lost track of him, 
after the mid 70s. So what he did in the 80s and 90s, Lord knows. And that's a prevailing, you know, theme in the book is, you know, a lot of these guys I lost track of. Some of them I found and, and tried to confront <laughs> later on. And, um, mm. you know, especially in regards to the Fessenden School, which was basically running a, a rate mill. And, um, and it, that's a whole other story that, you know, would take us a lot longer to to write. So um, mm. anyway, so we have Lee Savoy, 1974, gone. Andy Puglisi, 1976, gone. In between that, we had a boy in Brockton, Massachusetts, the son of a prominent attorney, the most prominent attorney in the town, who had just almost won the mayor's race the year prior, David Lewison, who disappears from his backyard while he's playing with trucks. And Chapman had, at one point, told investigators that he regularly haunted Brockton. This story, this boy's disappearance is, is one of the, you know, of all of them, it is the biggest fucking enigma of them all because his body was actually found later in 1980 in a steamer trunk of a house that was under construction at the time, uh, bottom level, two families lived in the uppers. It was a typical, you know, rough neighborhood house, three levels, three different families, you know, whatever. So, and it had been abandoned for some time, right? I think I'm taking that yeah. from your book, but yeah, it yeah. was abandoned. They were actually rehabbing it at the time. And there was yeah. one family that lived on the very top level. And that's how they found this trunk because they yeah. were like, holy shit, you know, we're trying to knock down some walls. We're trying to do some remodeling. We get this big steamer trunk here. And what do we do with it? They open it up. David Lewison's body is in it. Okay. Um, I had long suspected Chapman of being the murderer of David Lewison um, because he had made claims to the police. He had confessed that he, in fact, murdered David Lewison and then recanted multiple times. So uh, which was something that, you know, was prevailing in his life in his early crime career in crime in the late 1960s and early 70s. Chapman would take and rape boys all over this country, Virginia, Ohio. Uh, New York State, Pennsylvania. I, I, I detail it all in the book. At one point, he grabbed a boy um, basically in broad daylight and took him into a woods. And that boy came running out um, towards the street and a bunch of adults had seen him. And this happened in Oil City. And Chapman came running right out behind him and the adults said, what the fuck are you doing? He basically admitted to it right there and then. So he wasn't like some master criminal. He was more of a guy who was going to make very impulsive decisions when it came to his sexual proclivities and then fess up to him right away. He had gotten much smarter by 75 when the Lewis and stuff was really coming down hard on him. And he had Chapman had basically admitted to being with Lewis and over in the cemetery over in Brockton, uh, right off the main road there. Um, it's still there to this day. It's right off route 37. Uh, it's right next to the, baseball field where the Brockton rocks play for any of you guys who are listening to this, who are on the South shore. Um, Brockton rocks is sort of the big uh, uh, Red Sox sort of feeder team. It's an independent league. And uh, Christina's father actually used to work um, still does uh, work the game. So me and Christina would bring the kids all the time. So, and every time I was there, I would always make sure I would look at that goddamn cemetery. I would stare at that goddamn cemetery. Um, yeah. So, the thing that gets me about the Lewison case more than anything is his body's found in 1980 and Chapman had been in jail at that point doing his 30 year sentence for the two rapes in Lawrence for three years. And did they just fall upon that body or did Chapman give them that information? And that's a question that still tantalizes me to this moment, honestly. Yeah, yeah, it's um, I don't know. I, I I seem to remember seeing too. There was a young guy, like a twenty-two year old drifter, mm -hmm. drug addict kind of guy that yep. Ted was looking through the basement there for something mm -hmm. of potential resale value. I don't know if he was a drug addict or whatever, and he so he stumbled across the body too. But I know there's some controversy about whether that's a real story or not. But um, that's 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 not what's listed yeah. in the police report. Now I know many people have said um, I print the police report in full in the new one. Mm. And um, it was alleged that a 22 year old drug addict kid had found the body randomly. He was not involved with any of the fixing of the house or anything. There would be absolutely no reason for him to be there. 
which fed into a lot of speculation that maybe this was a kid that Chapman had groomed and he knew where the body was. Now we knew that Chapman groomed a lot of kids, right? He groomed a ton of kids, especially here in Rhode Island. He was a four H club member. He volunteered with kids all the time. It's fucking horrifying to think, but he did. And not only that, but he, he would make up fake four H clubs and he would literally hang up flyers and say, Hey, I'm Wayne come see me, you know, we'll, we'll do some stuff with the kids. So, and it was all bullshit. So, um, and, and Mintz has, has found those. So, um, but you know, the other, the one thing about Lewis and I want to hit on more than anything is just, if let's just assume Chapman put him there, which I believe, why would they pick that house? What connection did Wayne Chapman have to Brockton and that particular house? Mm Mm-hmm. It couldn't have been random. Nothing in these cases are random. He knows right. someone, right. you know, um, like there's no conspiracies, but there's no coincidences. Right. And, yeah. um, you know, so, you know, in the book, I detail how, you know, I just fucking scoured property records, anything where I could get a name that could lead me to some connection to Chapman. So I could say, there it is. That's how he knew where to put it there. And I just could never find it. It's another one of those weird fucking stories that it's like a dream. There's no end. There's no beginning. And there's a lot of plot line missed, unfortunately. So, and even to this day, you know, um, you know, I had a contact in the Brockton police, an old friend who's no longer there, but I'm not going to say his name. And I would ask him, take a look at the Lewis in case for me. And I can say this now because he's no longer there. Um, and he would say, nope. Like you can't get into that without a lieutenant or above signing off on it. Why? Mm-hmm. Why? You know, it occurs to me now a new a new possible supporting theory for the accomplice idea in some of these cases. Um, Wayne Chapman. Now you ask questions, so we know there were many times that he had raped kids. We know for sure he was convicted of raping the two Lawrence boys. He did not kill those boys. He let them go. Let them so go. So why would? Why would the other kids that you know, we know the, the main one he's suspected of is Andy, but also in uh, Lewison and um, some of the other ones, why mm. would he why would he kill those? Well, if his preference was one way, but if he on those times when he has an accomplice and he's with someone who gets off on murder, mm-hmm. uh, now you it's not something that he would feel bad about. He, if he had any sense of conscience at all or empathy for other human beings, he wouldn't be raping them. So if his preference is just to rape boys, right? And then right. and he just doesn't really get off on killing him, so he generally doesn't. But on those times when he has an accomplice, if in order to get that accomplice to go along with him, that guy's preference is to stuff someone out, he's he's probably gonna go along with it, right? And, and, get, and, and right. in those er- <coughs> and in those areas where you're suspecting that he might be involved, this is where it gets interesting. There seems to be a reason to believe that he had some local connection, whether it's Lawrence without going too much into it, but whether it's Lawrence, whether it's (laughs) Brockton, the way the home was found. um, I don't know. All these, all these cases revere. I don't know if he's connected to that one at all, but um, to this, to the Lisa Savoy case at all. Um, But you have that, what's going on at that, that boy brothel thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so if there's anything that happened there, it likely involved if Wayne Chapman was involved, he probably had an accomplice in that situation too. I, I have long held the theory that Chapman probably was not a killer. I don't think like Bar Jonah Bar Jonah got off on people's pain. I mean, he was a true to life killer. And Charlie Pierce was also just a total sadistic pedophile murderer. He murdered boys, he murdered girls. Yeah. He, he necrophiliac. Had sex, so, he had sex yeah. with dead dead bodies. I mean, he was just yeah. a true true freak. I think yeah. Chapman was, you know, a pedophile who could be, you know, and maybe you know we've theorized that maybe sometimes he took it too far with some of these kids, and they ended yeah, up right. being severely injured. And then I even I even you know put forth a theory that maybe he made a couple phone calls or he went home and said, "Hey, I got an issue on my hands. This is going to bring a lot of heat to us. Maybe I know somebody in my circles who can get rid of this." You know, um, any one of those, any one of those tracks, because we don't know, we'll never know, mm-hmm. you know, and <clears throat> that said, um, you mentioned the Revere stuff. I guess we should, I should tell people a little bit, you know, cause all of this we're going to touch on in the film. 
from 74 to 77, a 242 Mountain Ave in Revere, the <coughs> locals were coming forward to authorities and saying that they were finding a lot of kids at this specific address out late at night, smoking on the back deck, consuming alcohol. And we're talking 11 to 14 year old boys, mostly some, some, some a little older, 16, 17 year olds, all project kids, all kids of the system, foster kids, things like that. Um, and the authorities got onto it and eventually the FBI raided this home. <clears throat> and what they found was a long client list of men who came into that home for the specific reason of having sex with little boys. And um, the main, uh, you know, the man who owned the house, who basically ran the brothel, um, was given a 30 year sentence. And he did every minute of that uh, at MCI Norfolk and then later on at Bridgewater and is actually out today and lives in West Roxbury. Um, the reason why it's so important is because there was a it, it's it, if it's a period piece, we're trying to show you what the flavor of the world was at that time in that little bit of area. OK, and what it was, was a lot of powerful people, heads of industries, professors, deans doctors, head of endocrinology at a Boston hospital were all on the client list and they were all paying to have little sex, uh, uh, sex with little boys in this one home. And Kevin referenced Nambla earlier when all, when, when, when that house was raided and all these men were round up and arrested, um, you know, the very powerful gay journalist named David Brill, um, and David Thorstead, who is a long serving NAMBLA member, was the PR guy for NAMBLA way up into the 2000s when he died, basically started writing like, hey, this was a witch hunt. It's all overblown. It wasn't that bad. These kids weren't, you know, the true story will never be known. But, uh, you know, the police agreed because, you know, a lot of guys did, did some significant time and some didn't do a lot at all. Um, and. So this was broken up in 77. NAMBLA was formed in direct response to what had happened with that roundup to the point where they even went to Bridgewater uh, to the Massachusetts Treatment Center for the Sexually Dangerous where me and Kevin uh, last saw each other walking through a cemetery. Um, uh, and, and, monster and did, Yeah, Monster, monster University. And um, what they did there was they did a, uh, a long protest and behind those walls at that very moment was Bar Jonah, Wayne Chapman, and Charlie Pierce. That's how we tie this all together is that, listen, you have a bustling chi uh, child pornography business happening here in Providence. We know it. We know it. We know it. People went to jail. There's a gentleman here um, who moved to California who was uh, an adult film mogul for the mob. He created all the, you know, those amazing video stores that you see that sell all the sex toys and shit. He created that. That's his company. He owned it. He sold it off. Now, he did federal prison time for for the production of child pornography. He did it. Um, and he came right here from Providence. We know it happened here. And we know, you know, uh, the big mob business was here. The Boston mob was run by guys like Whitey Bulger. They... As far as I could ever tell, they were not partaking in these type of things like the patriarchs were here. So, um, so that's sort of how that all ties together, uh, to the best of my ability, anyway. And you know, at the end of the day, it's just very hard for me to come off of that idea that you have some really sick perverts like Chapman willing to do the business of these mobsters, and little boys get get injured and killed in, in, in the commission of it. It's almost like a Rico thing, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's some of the times, you know, it's, we all have a temptation to want to connect dots mm. and the conspiracy theory is more interesting than just the lone wolf, like Lee Harvey Oswald. But that doesn't change the fact that they're in, certain cases in certain situations certainly in the pedophilia world there seem things seem to be highly organized yeah and like you talked about these guys find their own tribe back then you didn't have the internet so but they had other ways they just recognized each other they're in the, the adult bookstore and, and that kind of thing and it's just they find their own and um and once they do they 
stay connected. They share techniques. Yep. Uh, that's why we call Bridgewater State Hospital Monster U because <laughs> these guys were sharing techniques in there. This is what we're going to do when we get out, you know? Yep. And um, yeah, that's, you know, but it's, it's very difficult to prove any of those connections. You have a great letter. Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Is that going to come out in the book obsession? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. All the, all the letters, there's about 22 pages of letters back and forth between Nathaniel Barjona and Wayne Chapman. Barjona was locked up in Concord on a case where he took two boys in Shrewsbury, put them in the trunk of his car, tried to kill them both. They both survived, thank God. And he got 20 years on it. Chapman's already here in Bridgewater, and Chapman is literally telling him, this is what you got to say to get back over here with me. Um, and again, these two, unless they knew each other in the outside world, would have never have crossed paths to know each other like that. So, mm -hmm. um, it's just, I don't think I'm even connecting dots there. I think, and I'm not picking on you, by the way, that's, you're right. People do have the tendency yeah. to connect dots. I have a tendency to connect dots that sometimes are not there. I just, I need to be governed in that way. I know that about myself, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it, but it's just, well, it's not just me, you. It's, it's, it's very much human nature, Dave, where our brains are pattern recognition machines. That's what they do. Like everything that your senses are taking in, you're seeing here and you're stitching together patterns and trying to match it so you see a bird in the tree your brain just sees a bunch of little pixels and it matches it together to a, oh that's a bird i mean that's so it's very human it's it's what we do you know yeah and, and to me it's like when i see letters like that it's like you know it's more than confirmation it's it's you know you start doing the mental math on it it's like they could have never crossed paths chapman's always been here barjon has always been here they only could have known each other in the outside world. That's the only way that those two people would know each other. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's that, that's sort of where I get it. And there's, there's a lot of them, you know, um, yeah. that continued on forever. Barjona left prison, got himself out, ended up in Montana and, and they were still, I mean, all in, all the way into the late nineties. Um, they connected with each other. I mean, I have letters where Chapman is, is giving him pointers on how to get a better position at Hardy's where he worked at. I'm not kidding. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this is well into the nineties. So it, it's, it's, it, it appears anyway, but unfortunately all of the, uh, uh, principles that we're talking about here are dead and there's just no way to ever know, but that doesn't mean I'm going to stop. I'll, I'll never stop. This is like, you know, I, I titled this episode. I have an obsession. I titled the book that, because I truly do have an obsession because, you know, when I see these kids, um, I, I really think about myself. I think about myself, you know, I think this is me. This yeah. could have been me. Yeah. It, it very well could have been me. Maybe some of these guys who were involved in this were the same guys who'd done things to me and hurt yeah. my life and ruined my life for, you know, and, that's just unfortunately my lot in life. You know, I wish I was a banker and I had a nice upbringing and, you know, I, I, you know, advise people on their wealth or something, <laughs> but I'm not, you know? Okay. So, um, yeah. so anyway, and you know, so when we first initially started talking about the doc, we wanted to dig back deeper, um, into all these cases. One of them, you know, we basically, I don't want to give us, be too boisterous about this, those of you who read the book are going to know that there's a name in that book. And I love telling this story more than anything because it validates a lot of things that me and you have done in the past. And there was a huge mystery regarding uh, a young boy who went missing in the town of Webster, Massachusetts in 1978. This young man was known as the mayor of the town. All the kids knew him. Adults knew him. Beautiful little kid. Lo you know, he was well loved in the community. This boy went missing. Okay, never been found to this day. A man in 1999 made a deathbed confession. That's the Amato kid, right? Amato. Yeah, we're, we're talking about Andrew Amato, four years Andrew old, Amato. Webster, yeah. Massachusetts. A man made a deathbed confession in 1999. He killed Andrew. He was on the scene that day. He's the one who brought back the Weeble toy that Andrew had lost. And, you know, the, the National Guard and the state police were like, we've searched everywhere for that. There's no way this guy could have found it unless he fucking had it, but they just didn't have any evidence on him. And he was allowed to walk free for 25 years. 99, he's dying of cancer. He makes a deathbed confession to his family. They go and excavate the house. The man's name was never mentioned anywhere. Anywhere. I could, I scoured records in the town of Webster 
looking for a death certificate, an obituary, somebody that would match that age and cause of death. So I could go, let me go to that family. Just could never find it. And I write about it in the book. I talk about how fucking frustrating it was. Anyway, fast forward to the summer of 23. Me and you are, are shooting the shit on a live stream about it. And within an hour of getting off that live stream, I've got a message on my Facebook saying I was present for that excavation. I am the daughter of that man who was a, uh, a serial pedophile, a priest, and his family thinks he killed more. And here we are. Um, that man's name was Harold Neal of Warwick, Rhode Island, and eventually later Boroughville, Rhode Island. And there's a whole lot more to know about Neil. And there's a whole lot more for me to say about Neil uh, in future times. Uh, but it solved the biggest mystery. I mean, it just shows you the power. And I, I, I want to segue here into the armchair detective stuff. But it just shows you the power of this right here. You know, within an hour, we know. Yeah. 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 yeah there's a lot of problems potentially with armchair detectives and youtube channels and all that stuff but there's there is good that can come from it and that was definitely a case there and i don't know if you want to wait until another episode or or your book but it would be interesting just to hear more about this guy neil and what mm -hmm. he just his profile and what he did in his experience yep. leading up to uh because i think it's i think it's interesting if you want to talk about it just a quick just elevator pitch on Neil is he was present the day it happened. Um, he had said that he had heard on a CB radio that Andrew was missing and he found the Weeble toy that Andrew was missing um, in an area that had already been searched thoroughly. The police suspected him right off the bat and they could just never get him to crack. Neil was a truck driver, so he was transient. He was all over the state, all over the country at certain points. He was also a priest who worked in a parish in Warwick, Rhode Island. He was an evil guy. Um, he was uh, basically estranged from his daughters and sons. He had nine children, which does not fit the profile usually of serial killers. Uh, I'm not saying he is one, but his family really believes him to be one. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, he lived in Barraville, Rhode Island, which is a, if anybody who knows this area, Barraville is weird because it like at three different points in Barraville, it's touching Connecticut it touches Massachusetts and it's obviously in Rhode Island. So it's one of those weird cities. Um, and it's a very like a uh, wooden wooded area. And they, they, he mentioned that Andy was uh, Amato. We're talking about was buried under some power lines behind Neil's home. He had long rows of power lines and it was all fields behind it. He had acre property back there and they excavated it, but they could never find uh, Andrew's body. And unfortunately Neil passed away. Uh, he was known as a very violent man, a man who was uh, a, a known pedophile. Uh, your your kids stayed away from him. He was that guy on the block that just nobody crossed. And um, there's a lot more to say. I've been interviewing members of his family for ever since that night, really, on what, Yellow Cottage Tales uh, over the summer. Wasn't the FBI and, out in his yard after he died, too? Yeah. Yeah. FBI was um, uh, it somehow... Um, how these things happen, what's the predicate, right? It sounds like other cases, but um, how the FBI got involved, we'll never know. Um, well, I guess maybe we will know. Maybe I'll find out. But in my estimation, it's probably just the fact that Boroughville is a very small town and they may not have the resources for something like that. But they had to have suspected something and they were out there. Didn't you say they found vats of acid or something in the in the shit yeah or vats of yeah unusual or they found two barrels uh full of acid where his family i mean and this family's fucking weird i'm not i don't think i'm being mean when i say this i've talked to them all they're fucking weird um his family believed that he buried another boy in a home in Pawtucket. they believed that he dissolved at least three other bodies in those acid tanks that he had out back and they told all this to the fbi the fbi knows it um mm. there's just no way to it was it's either uh, you have this sick motherfucker uh, on one hand, or you have a family that loves to tell some really crazy stories on the other hand. But um, well, there's no innocent reason for keeping vats of acid in your shed. I don't think. Yeah, I, I don't know. know. Right? Especially if you're a truck driver. I don't know. Maybe there's some use <laughs> for it that I don't know. But <laughs> and <clears throat> the only reason I even got on this case with Neil and Andrew Amato because it doesn't relate. It doesn't really relate to Chapman. Chapman was already long in prison, and so wasn't. Anybody in uh, the principals were already long in prison. But if you Google Andrew Amato's name right now, 
the first thing you're going to read is that Barjona was a main suspect. And that's just not true. Barjona could never have done this. Um, mm. It was done more than likely by Harold Neal. But Barjona and Chapman, you know, there's so much connections to Neal because, you know, Barjona is from Webster. Chapman had, had uh, admitted to committing crimes in Webster. He had admitted to being in Barrowville, and we know that because Al Mintz told us a story about how uh, Chapman had stopped by his house uh, to talk to his kids at one point, and he lived in Barrowville. So we knew that Chapman was familiar with that area. So um, I just thought that to be a fact that was really hard for me to overlook. And I actually found the motto case because once I learned that story from Al, Albert, um, I was like, well, let me see if there's any missing kids in Barville. And right off the bat, you know, Andrew Amato came up. So, um, yeah, I feel like, you know, that was a cool, you know, and as we, we've sort of morphed this film into being more about like, okay, what happened in the seventies? And now it's more, it's, we've kind of spread the, the, the tentacles out a little bit to like, okay, let's take a look at people who are like web sleuths, you know, um, it doesn't get a better example of what happened just this summer with us. Honestly, I don't, I, I don't know of a better one. Yeah. Just thinking about all I've, it's been an experience for me to see all the different reasons that people become obsessed with these things. Uh, we talked to a guy that we want to interview Brett up in Maine, <laughs> who's interested in a lot of these cases too, but he's, you know, uh, he's a little, my age or a little bit older. Um, I think he was a successful salesman and stuff, but eventually kind of became obsessed with this to the point where he threw away much of his life. And when we were talking to him this summer and we were supposed to go up there and hopefully we'll get up there in the spring, he was living in a house. He had no car, he had no furniture. All he wanted us to right. do was bring him coffee and have, and listen, you know, let us let give, give him a chance to tell his story, but he's done a lot of research into this. Um, and even just also to me, like when we were down in Lawrence with Melanie, right. And so I grew up in Lawrence. I knew where that project was across the street where they grew up, but I had always driven around it. I had never been in the back. And so Melanie took us on a tour down in the back there where she lived and where Andy had lived. And it was surprisingly actually beautiful. Uh, mm. You wouldn't you'd get, obviously projects have a bad rep for every, but it was really, really beautiful down there, you know, and you could see where it would be a nice place to live for kids, you know, and all the families would get to know each other. But for Melanie, um, this area has whole places and the, the area where Andy's body, where Andy went missing, has taken on much more meaning that it's almost, I don't know, it's become like a shrine to her. And yeah. Yeah, how sure. deeply personal this whole case is to so and it it's in a place that I can't get to. I it's it, she's in her own area on it it's mm -hmm. she's extremely intelligent so has but and she can be very rational but this is also <laughs> very very personal you know and and it's it's um it's a pl i can see it but i can't get there you know i don't know exactly yeah. she's looking at the crows and thinking there's a connection mm -hmm. between the crows mm -hmm. and andy and and this kind of what's become a sacred site to her and I don't say any of that disparagingly. It's it's sure the the events of what happened there, both her youth, Andy going missing, and she only lived there I think for a few years. Um, but it all is now filled with so much meaning to her, you know. And I think that's what happens with a lot of these people, not to the extent that because most people can't look into these cases the way that Melanie did, but this stuff has a personal meaning when they look into whatever case that they're getting obsessed with right so right i don't know it's it's better to do what you did what you said in the beginning you were spot on people ask me all the time how can you write about this shit you write a whole book you write another one totally revolving around child murder and and and, and sexual you know um, um assault and <clears throat> i do take myself i look at it like a puzzle yeah i look at it like i have you know 10 pieces and i need to make them fit however i can fit and i want to take all my emotion out of it, you know? And I think that's the, really the only way you can survive doing something like that, you know? And I do talk about how dark, you know, I've, I've gone over the years, you know, and then maybe those times will come again. I don't know. Um, I can't, I know I'm good right now as we sit here talking to each other and um, for Mel, you know, it's the same thing. She it's, you can't get there. She lived it. You know, it's her, it, it's our, 
it's our media story. It's it's our reporting. It's our headline. But to her, it's her life. You know. So yeah. Um, yeah. So we're gonna we're and, gonna and explore in so many a lot other that, ways but... too. You know, as in so many other ways too, because she goes down there and probably has in her. I don't want to put words in her mouth, but probably kind of has conversations with Andy and her mind's view of Andy down there. So, and she's yeah. probably been doing this for 20, 30 years or more. And so much of Melanie is down there too. You know, everything right. that she's gone through in her life, you know, I think her daughter is handicapped, but I mean, so all the personal things that we all go through in our lives, she, that became her place to go. And so that's all inter wine tier and intertwined yep. here and it's um it it's important it's it, 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 i'm not dismissing at all it's important it's an important that's what we want to hit on the documentary is that this all stuff is personal for people that are really developing an obsession with a case or a theory um any one of these right. cases <laughs> so that's what we're gonna do we're gonna use this case as a sort of a background and tell you know some stories about uh some people who are sort of obsessed with these cases and we're going to try and intertwine all that together uh the best we can and come up with some really interesting content for you guys um you know you know a lot of people really like they have pet cases and for me this is my life's work right here uh when my they chisel my gravestone it's not going to say you know uh it's going to be about this so uh, in this period in time that I didn't even live through, but, you know, I'm obsessed with. So um, it's not going to say the Belich president of the Belichick fan club. Yeah, no, definitely not. But uh, actually, you know what? We'll get off on that. Who do you like this weekend? I, I finally have decided I am. See, I look at this strictly from a Patriots fans perspective, and it's a sure, nightmare sure. because oh, San Francisco, is. if they win that seven Super Bowls, that puts them ahead of the Patriots. If yep. Kansas City wins, they're now a dynasty. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just one more. And w it, with a dynasty that's threatening to overcome the Patriots dynasty, if they oh, yeah. continue on this path, right? Mahomes um, is still young. So yep. I've decided, well, first of all, I do think Kansas City is going to win. I think their mm -hmm. defense is good. Yep. And and I, I think San Francisco's defense is not as good as it's been in other years. They haven't looked that great in the playoffs. And Mahomes versus Purdy. Come on, <laughs> mm. that's Mahomes, yep. right? So, right. Um, but of course, we said that in the Carolina when it was Brady versus what the hell's his name here? That that one, one year, uh, one year. Jake Delholm. Jake, Jake Delholm, yeah, Jake yep. Delholm, yeah. Um, so, I mean, you never know. I, that's why the game is interesting. But so, I think Detroit's going to win. But I'm going to go with I wish San Francisco would win, just because. Yeah, I do think Detroit's. I mean, Kansas City is. They're going to be. If you don't stop them, they're going to be an incredible dynasty. They're going to be the greatest dynasty of all time on, on the path they're on now. So I got to root against them. Uh, <laughs> don't forget that the also the immortal Nick Foles beat Tom Brady in a Super Bowl. So yeah. Um, yeah. there's that. Yeah. I will say this. Um, San Francisco is a great team. Eh, they're a good team. They're not a great team. Um, good defense. Good, good weapons. McCaffrey's a hell of a player. Uh, Debo oh, yeah. is a hell of a player. They're all great players, right? They're star studded. Patriots fans have seen this movie at least 10 times. You just Mahomes is Brady like, and you just don't bet against them in a game for your life or a game for anything. Um, you don't bet against them. Could again, Brady lost three Super Bowls. Could something weird happen? Sure. I wouldn't be shocked at all. That being said, money on the line right now, the Kansas City Chiefs are winning on Sunday. That's just me. Mahomes is Brady like. So. Plus the Mahomes Kelsey connection. It's so when you have worked with a guy that long, a guy that's that good too, but that guy that long, you need a big play. You got fourth down and four and you're going for it. Yeah. Those two are on the same wavelength. And they that's are. something that takes years to develop. Yep. And, yep. you know, we saw that. We've seen it before with Brady and Gronk and other plays too. So, I mean, yep. it's just, I don't know. Does Purdy have that with anybody there? I, you know, I, I can't, I got to admit, I, I haven't watched a ton of uh, uh, San Francisco football this year. Um, you know, they're, I mean, they probably shouldn't even be in the game, right? They were down by 20 something points just, you know, two weeks ago. So 
And um, they got their asses kicked by Baltimore in the biggest game that they played this year in the regular season. Kansas City just beat Baltimore last week. Kansas City's played on the road basically this whole playoffs. They're battle tested. They got a great defense. Mahomes has been there, done that. Everything to me is pointing towards Kansas City. But what the fuck do I know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah. we'll see. It should be interesting. Um, you're right. If 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 Mahomes wins this, this is three, and he's 28 years old. Kev, three Super Bowls. He's yeah. 28 years old. So uh, the only person who's ever five kept... years too, right? So yeah, three, that's three and five, five years. Yep, yep. Yeah. Four appearances, three wins. Um, the only super, the only person who's ever kept him away from a championship was number 12, Tom Brady. So um, yeah. should be interesting, guys. Enjoy your Super Bowl Sunday, uh, Kevin. Thanks so much for hanging with me, bro. We got to do this again. Absolutely. We'll do it soon. You be well. I will talk to you soon, my friend. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Nice talking to you. See you, buddy.